Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Wow, I'm excited about this year, and uh, you know, like that weight challenge there, uh, I'm going to do that. I, I think it's always exciting, you know, the new year, it's like, I want to get healthier, I want to do things to grow closer to God, right? We all have some new year resolution, some we don't verbalize because we don't want to be held accountable to it, right? <laughs> but we're hoping maybe this next year, I'm going to maybe get a little bit healthier, right? Or maybe this next year I, I'm going to get closer to God and closer to others the way God wants me to. I, and at least inside we're thinking that, right? Well, this year I'm excited because I want to put feet to those hopes in our lives. Because I, I really believe this next year could be our greatest year yet as a church and our greatest year as a person of God. I want us to draw closer to God and closer to each other. I believe God has put a vision on my heart for this church this year, uh, this is our, our big vision for this year, is to provide a clearer path of discipleship where we can grow closer to God and closer to others. Do you like that? And, and, and I, I really feel like we are followers of Christ. If you know him, you are a follower. That means you're a disciple, right? So you need to grow right? You need to grow in your faith. Just like you want your, your kids to grow up, we need to grow up in our faith. And so this year, I want a clear path for us. And so in the next four weeks, on Sunday mornings and on Wednesdays, we're going to be going through four classes that will help you grow in your faith. And I'm super excited about it. So this Wednesday will be our first class. It's our partnership class. We'll talk about what it means to worship God and to join in a community of faith. And, and so if you haven't taken that class in a couple years, uh, I would encourage you to retake it because it's changed a lot. We've refined it a lot, and I think it's going to be life-changing. So here's our idea on growing closer. Uh, we want to grow closer as we worship by responding to who God is and what he has done. Uh, worship is really a response to who God is and what he's done in our lives. And then Closer as we connect in community with grace-filled relationships. Why do we have to add grace-filled? Because we're not all perfect. In fact, none of us are perfect, right? And we need grace, right? And where do we receive grace from? From God first, right? Uh, the third area to grow closer as we grow closer in faith with personal application. That's where faith takes feet. That's where it takes roots, is when we start to apply faith in our own lives. And then grow uh, closer as we serve in the local church to build up God's family. We represent Jesus to our community. We represent that Jesus can save all of us, that we are redeemed by his precious blood. And then to grow closer as we share God's message of forgiveness in Christ. We have the hope of salvation and the world around us, our family, our friends, our community needs to know about Jesus. Do you believe that? All right. So every, every, se every series we do, we have a remember verse. So our remember verse for this series is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. That's going to be our remember verse. And I, I really felt like this verse kind of hones this in for us. And, and the way to remember the, a passage is you say it several times to yourself. You ask questions about it. You start to own this verse. And I want us to own this verse over the next few weeks. Peter says this, but you are a chosen people. Now just stop for a moment. God knows you by name. He loves you so much he what? He chose you to have a relationship with you. That's pretty amazing, right? And, and then he says, a royal priesthood. Now pause for a moment. What is a priesthood? What, what is a priest supposed to do? Minister, help people know God better, right? That's the role of a priest. Now I'm a pastor, I'm a priest, right? But he says, we're all a royal priesthood. So not just the pastors here, not just Joey and I and, and James, but all of us are to help people what? Know Jesus, right? Find and follow Jesus. And then a holy nation. Holy, it means to be set apart. God makes us holy. A people belonging to God. There's your new identity. And that's the identity we represent in our community. That there is a redeeming power in the precious blood of Christ. We belong to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. See, that's our response. That's what worship is. Declare his 
praises. But unless you understand you've been called out of darkness into light, you're not going to declare his praises. You, you can't declare what you don't know. But if you do know his, his redeeming power in your life, then you can declare. And then this verse 10, uh, this, this emphasizes that once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. This isn't just speaking about the Jewish nation. This is speaking about anybody who has been redeemed by Jesus. Have you been saved by Jesus? Then this is talking to you, to me. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received what? Mercy. And out of mercy, we respond to God. Uh, so today, we're going to look at two areas. Today, we're going to focus in on what it means to draw closer in worship and clo closer in connecting in community. So first, as we talk about this as a church, to draw closer to loving God and to loving people. That's what worship is, and that's what connecting is all about into a community of faith. So to draw closer in 2020, we need to understand first truth. Our worship is a response to who God is and what he has done. I want you to open up your program. Let's take notes. Uh, there's a benefit. If you take notes, you're going to remember twice as much. If you start to take notes this year, it's 2020. Take advantage of this year. We're going to go through two books of the Bible this year. We're going to go through the book of Colossians. It's going to be a great understanding of the depth of who God is in our life and to understand his holiness and his grace and mercy in our lives. It's going to be fantastic. Then we're going to go through the book of James and how to apply God's word in our everyday life. It's going to be fantastic. If you take notes, <laughs> you're going to have that as a resource for your life. So I encourage you, take notes today. Uh, so to draw closer to God, our worship is a response to who God is and what he has done. I first started to write this message, and I started to use um, Psalm 119 and Psalm 150 to explain, you know, what our response of worship is, what it means to shout for joy, what it is to sing, what it is to kneel. But you know what? I don't need to give you that. You know why? You know how to worship. You all know how to worship. Anybody have a favorite sports team? Anybody have a favorite sports team? Okay, anybody have a favorite football team? Come on, football's coming up, right? Super, okay, Super Bowl. What if your team was in the Super Bowl this year? How excited would you be? See, I don't need to tell you how to worship, how to get excited, because what? You're excited, you're responding to your team, Right? I don't need to tell you how to shout because if they're, if they're scoring a touchdown, guess what? You're, you're shouting. You're excited. I, I don't need to tell you how to anticipate a victory if you see them on the goal line and they're ready to go through, right? That's what worship is. And the more we understand who God is, then we respond in worship. I, I, I just... <clears throat> I think as a people of God, if we could understand this better this year, it would be life-changing. But sometimes we, we come into church and it's like, oh, I just missed a few songs, no big deal. And it's like, it's a big deal. Because our God is deserving of praise and worship. And, and the more I know God, the more I will respond in worship. So Jesus says this, he's, he's asked this question several times in, in the Gospels. What's the most important command? If, if you could sum it up, Jesus, if you could say what's the most important command in all of the Old Testament, what is absolutely at the top of the list? And, and sometimes they try to trick him, and, and some people are just asking, just honestly, a, a rich young ruler was asking, honestly, what is it? How do I, I make sure that I'm right with God? And here, even the religious leaders, they're asking, but they're kind of trapping him. And what is the most important thing? And Jesus says, the most important thing is this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. With all your heart, with all your passion. That's what worship is. That's what worship is. Uh, with your soul, with your whole being, with your strength, everything. That's what worship is. To love God with your mind, intellectually, you focus in on who God is. That's what worship is, responding to God. I thought this passage here in Isaiah would be a great, uh, just a glimpse of who God is, what inspires us to respond in worship. 
Isaiah, we, we read the passage in Isaiah 9, 6 this last Christmas season, you know, as we, Isaiah prophesied who the Messiah would be. He would be God in flesh, God with us, right? The mighty God, almighty God. Well, Isaiah has a vision of heaven, just a glimpse. Imagine just seeing a glimpse of heaven. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Not just average, but high and exalted. And if we could just visualize for a moment who God is and how holy and how awesome he is, high and exalted. Above him were seraphs. These are angelic beings created by God for worship. I saw seraphs, each with six wings. Uh, Two wings they covered their faces, two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they were flying. Uh, Why covering their, their face? Because you can't look into the most holy God. Because he is so holy. I mean, can you just picture that for a moment? How holy and righteous God is? Why cover their feet? Because you can't touch the ground there. It's so holy. It's so righteous. God has no flaw in him. He is perfect. He is righteous. And he is deserving of worship. And they're flying back and forth to worship God and to proclaim him and they, they call out to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. And, and when we look at this earth, I, I know there's flaws and defect because of our sins. There's pollution, and, and it just kills me when people throw trash in the ocean or trash on the floor or anywhere. But you still can see the glory of God, can't you? When you look at the design of all creation, there is no question in the world, there's no question in my mind that there is a righteous and holy God, that he designed everything, our human life, the complexity of our bodies. The earth is full of his glory. The earth cries out that there is holiness here created by God. Even with all the flaws, we still can see that. Look at verse 4. At the sound. At the what? At the what? That's why it's important for us to sing. There needs to be a voice part to what we believe, what we feel, what we experience, what we respond to. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. They're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It's so loud. Again, when you sing, there should be volume to it, right? I, I, I guarantee you, if your football team makes it into the Super Bowl, mine isn't, but if yours does, you're going to be loud, aren't you? You're going to be excited. And that's what's happening in heaven. Now, what's the response? Look at verse 5. Here's the response. Woe to me. <laughs> What's the response? Uh-oh. <laughs> when you understand how holy and righteous God is, there's the response of repentance, isn't there? There's a response of, uh-oh. <laughs> God, you're holy, and I'm, I'm not. And there should be a response here of, of repentance, of, of wanting to be right with God. So he cries out, uh, and this is, uh, understand, this is who? Isaiah, the prophet of God? And if anyone is as right as rain here, it would seem to be Isaiah, and yet he's saying, uh-oh, God, I'm, I'm ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Anybody besides me can relate to Isaiah? Can you relate to him? I, and I'm a man of unclean lips. Uh, can you admit that? And, and again, I think our worship is powerful when we're honest, when we're real before God. I think when people walk in here, if they see there is genuine, real response to how holy and righteous and awesome God is, It's attractive because there's no pretense. I'm not holy in myself. 
I have a bad attitude at times. I say the wrong things all the time. <laughs> can you relate to Isaiah? See, if we can become more real and more honest in our worship, I think it's powerful. And then, verse 6, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. He's made holy by who? By God, his holiness, right? God sends his son, Jesus, to atone for our sins. He takes our sins, our shame, and our guilt. He goes to the cross. He is our substitute, and he atones for our sins by what? Dying for our sins. Now look at this verse again. He says, your guilt is what? Your guilt is what? Some of you need to hear yourself say that, so please, everyone say this with me. Your guilt is what? Taken away. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Because some of us are still trying to beat ourselves up. And yet Jesus paid for it. Am I going to say, Jesus, you didn't do a good enough job on the cross. It wasn't enough for me. I need to accept that my guilt has been taken away. <laughs> it's been paid for in full. And then my response is worship. And then my response is, look what Isaiah says. Then, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I. Send me. And, and that's how the church works, isn't it? Because once you have experienced God's holiness, once you've experienced him atoning for your sins, paying for your sins, my hand's up. My hand's up. But Isaiah, you don't know how much this is going to cost you. My sins have been paid for. I no longer have to pay for my guilt. My hand's up. Send me. Isn't that how the church works? I mean, if we worked on just, hey, you're obligated to serve, that doesn't work. But if you've been redeemed, if your sins have been paid for, if your life has been changed, guess what? My hand's up. You don't know how long it's going to take. I don't care. Are you kidding me? I've seen angelic beings flying around the throne of God. <laughs> my hand's up. My sins have been paid for. My hand's up. God, send me. I want to serve you. I want to make a difference in my community because we are redeemed people. Our sins have been paid for. When we respond <laughs> in worship, it's life-changing. Amen? Amen? So our first truth is this. Uh, <laughs> I'm so excited here. Uh, to draw closer to God in 2020, our worship is a response to who God is and what he has done. Our second truth this morning is our worship either affirms or contradicts the message about God, our message about God. Our worship either affirms or contradicts. I and mean, if you look at um, Romans 1, when things go sideways and uh, they stop worshiping the almighty God, people don't stop worshiping, do they? In fact, it says they just start worshiping the created things rather than the creator. And so our worship just either affirms or contradicts what we believe about God. I mean, do you remember when Moses was up on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments? Do you remember that? Uh, how many remember that in Bible class? You know, all right? You remember that? Okay. So the, Joe, Moses is up there. He's getting the word from God. Okay, this is going to be the Ten Commandments. This is how we can live and honor God and honor one another. Excitement. But he's up there for a while. So what do the people do? Do they stop worshiping? Do you know what they did? You know what they did? Tell your neighbor. What do they do? What do they do? They worship a, a golden calf. What? They, they make a golden, what? 
Like, what? So do they stop worshiping? We are designed to worship. We're hardwired to worship. So we're either going to worship the Almighty God or we're going to worship something else. And, and they start worshiping a golden calf. Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments, God's word for us, how, how to honor him and, and how to honor one another. And instead, they got tired of waiting. And then they worship something else. Our worship either affirms or contradicts our message about who God is. Hebrews 10, 23 says, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is what? So let's don't move to the left or the right. Let's hold confidently to one hope, the hope that is in Jesus Christ. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let's encourage each other. That's why our connecting in community, that's why we've, we've opened up a little bit more time and space for us to fellowship because this is important. How we worship God is either going to affirm or contradict what we really believe about who our God is. And if people come here and see us connecting in love and grace and mercy, they're going to know God lives here. They're going to know that God's alive here. That God is important in our lives. Verse 25, it says, Let us not give up meeting together as some do, or in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, there's an encouragement that we need for, from each other. Hebrews 10, or Hebrews 13, 15, it says, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Sometimes worship is easy. And things are going great. You know, the girl you just, uh, the girl of your dreams you asked, and she said, yes. Yeah, easy to worship. And sometimes it's not going great. Sometimes life is a mess. Amen? And then it really is a sacrifice of what? Praise. A sacrifice of praise. But I can look at Jesus and go, Jesus, right now, life isn't easy. Life isn't going smoothly. Life is hard. But Jesus, you're worthy of giving praise. Because my guilt has been taken away. My sins have been paid for. You know how hard it is to live in this earth because, Jesus, you did it yourself, yet without sin. And we offer up a sacrifice of praise. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifice, God is pleased. I can be honest with you. There are times I get here on Sunday morning and it's easy to worship. And there are times I get here on Sunday morning and it's not. Because life isn't good, easy, or comfortable. But I worship. Why? Because it's a sacrifice of praise. All worship involves sacrifice. All worship involves sacrifice. And as we give to God, as we sing praises to God, as we serve God, that's all acts of worship. That's all responding to who God is. Uh, so our, our first truth is to draw closer in 2020, we need to understand our worship is a response to who God is and what he has done. Our second truth is to draw closer in 2020, we need to understand our worship either affirms or contradicts our message about God. And the third truth is to draw closer in 2020. We need to understand our worship requires us to connect with grace-filled relationship. Requires us. And, and, you know, I didn't have the word require, by the way, when I first started to write out this theme. And I was like, does it just lead us or does it require us? As I was convinced that, no, it requires us to love each other. Because this is, this is what God's word tells us. Jesus says, loving God first, right? That's, that's the first commandment. If you do that, you're going to be right with God. Love God with your, your heart, your soul, your mind, right? But then he says, 
in Matthew 22, 39. And secondly, equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the, de- and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. How is that? That just loving God and loving others, how does everything sum up into that? Well, think about it. If you look at the, the Ten Commandments, they're not suggestions, by the way, they're commandments, right? Loving God, honoring him, having nothing above him, but him being first in our lives, making a day that is set aside, keeping the Sabbath set aside to worship God. That's all about God, right? Well, what about not stealing from your neighbor? That's what? Loving others. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to go over to John and say, hey, I like your chop saw, buddy. <laughs> and I'm not going to steal it. Not coveting your neighbor's wife. Wife, because I love my neighbor. So all the laws are really summed up into two things. Loving God, which is worship, and loving others, which is connecting the community, Right? And so it's not a suggestion. It doesn't just lead us, but it is a requirement if we're going to be followers of Jesus. In 1 John, he, he describes it this way. <laughs> we love because he loved us first, right? He first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his bro- brother, he is a liar. Ouch. Ouch. But you can't say you love God that you can't see, and yet the person right across from you, you're saying, I don't love you. See, you don't have to like me, but you have to what? You have to what? That was hard for you to say? (laughs) (laughs) Hey, I don't have to like you either. (laughs) But I have to what? I have to love you. We have to love each other. For anyone who does not love, God, love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So it's a requirement. Uh, that's why we want to create space here on Sunday mornings. Uh, we know life is busy. We know for many families, this is about the only time that you can set aside for God. Because your week is just absolutely crazy. So we wanted to create more space and more time. And that's why we have meeting a little earlier. And thank you for showing up, you know. And, and that's why at, at outside you'll see that it's more created, family friendly. And, and we want you to enjoy a cup of coffee. We want you to have some donut holes with your kids. And, and I'm going to encourage you to ask one question over the next couple of weeks. Just one question. When you meet somebody and you introduce yourself... After you talk to them for a little bit, I want you to ask this question. How can I pray for you this week? How can I pray for you this week? It's a simple question. Easy to remember, isn't it? How many could use more prayer this week? Anybody? <laughs> right? So wouldn't you like someone to be praying for you this week? And I guarantee you this. If you meet somebody and you introduce yourself and you get to know them a little bit, it's like, hey, you know, I, I haven't really got to know you. My name's Ed. Your name is Derek. All right, cool. Um, and you get to know each other. You're a teacher, right? Oh, that's kind of cool. I, I love that. I have some great teachers uh, that have made a difference in my life. Hey, Derek, how can I pray for you this week? Now, if I honestly pray for Derek this week, do you think I'll remember Derek's name? Yeah, you will. <laughs> but if I don't pray for him, probably not. So that's my challenge, is you to just ask that one question, is how can I pray for you this week? We'll wrap it up here in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. We are the body of Christ. Our church represents the redemptive power of Christ in our world. And why us and why not angels? Because we've experienced his redeeming power in our lives. We've experienced our guilt being removed. And and so Paul writes to us as the church, he says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. You need to belong to a local church, whether it's this church or church cross street or somewhere, you need to belong to a church. As you represent Christ, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. 
Because it's Jesus who we worship. In him, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. Together. Not this building. Praise God, we have a great building. We have great facilities. But we represent Christ. In him, we are the building together. In him, you two were being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Where there's two or three gathered together, guess what? Jesus is here in our midst. We represent Christ to our world. So choosing to belong to a, a loving family, that's one of the, the, the challenges I have for you today. Belong to a church. Whether this church, another church, you need to belong to a local church that you can serve God and raise up his name. And then the challenge is to do your part. Like Isaiah, it's like, my hand's up. I want to serve somewhere. And I think it's important, as we discover our gifts, you'll discover areas that you can serve maybe as more better fitted for you. But there's also secondary areas that we all serve in, just to proclaim the name of Christ. There were groups meeting as early as 7 o'clock this morning so that you could experience worship at 915 because we're dedicated to raising up the name of Christ here. And then choosing to share the message of hope. Have, have you experienced your sins being forgiven? Yes or no? Have you? Do you know that your guilt's been paid for? That you don't have to pay for it for yourself? Then we need to share that hope with the world around us. Let's pray together. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed just for a moment. Where do you need to draw closer to God in worship or connecting? Where do you need to draw closer in worship? How is your response to worship this morning? Are you glad that you're here? Are you glad that you get to sing praises to your Savior? Are you glad that your, your sins have been taken away and paid for? Where do you need to draw closer in your worship? Your response. How about relationships, connecting to a community of faith? Where do you need to draw closer in that? Because we are a house of faith in Christ, a house of worship. Father God, we, we just want to be honest with you this morning. Sometimes it is a sacrifice of praise because, Lord, it's early in the morning and it's cold and, and maybe this week hasn't gone smoothly. But, God, you are worthy of praise because you are holy and you are righteous. And, God, out of your love and out of your mercy, we don't get what we deserve. But instead, Lord Jesus, you came down to this earth and you put on flesh you lived a perfect life and you took our sins, our shame, and our guilt and you became our substitute on this cross. And you gave your life to redeem us, to pay for us, to atone for our sins. Lord, you are worthy and deserving of a response of praise this morning. So we praise you. We worship you. We give thanks to you. And as we're praying right now, maybe, maybe today is the day of your faith to begin in you, to have a personal relationship with Jesus. If, if you have not yet made that decision to invite Christ into your life, to be your Lord and Savior, to atone for your sins, to pay for your sins, would you do that this morning? I want to give you that opportunity as we pray together to say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. Lord, I confess I am unholy. I am a sinner. I need your forgiveness. And Jesus, I understand that you love me so much that you went to the cross. You died in my place to pay for my sins. And on the third day, you rose again. Today, I confess you as my Lord, my Savior, my God. Help me now to live my life to honor you, to bring praises to worship you, to honor you in my life and help me to live my life in expression of love. 
towards others. It's in the powerful name of Jesus we pray. And God's people said, amen.